What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Mass Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your senior enlisted advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my wonderful co-host. Uh, we got Julie Mitchell, and we all got a special co-host, retired Chief Mass Sergeant Sean Applegate. How y'all doing? Good. Hey. Doing good. Doing good. Thanks for the uh, invite. Yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. So for those that don't know uh, Sean Applegate, he was a uh, he was my predecessor uh, two two iterations ago. So Chief Reyes was before me. Sean Applegate uh, was uh, Chief Reyes replaced Sean Applegate. So. Uh, he he's a uh, chief mass sergeant uh, or SCA 1.0 and I'm 3.0. And so thank you so much, uh, Sean, for blazing the trail for me and, and allow me for this opportunity. So thank you much. Thank you. And he's also a, a, a fanatic of the Washington uh, sports team. So uh, we, we definitely want to give him this opportunity to, uh, to talk to somebody that he's he's been watching for a long time. Yep. So Absolutely. we have a very, very special guest with us today uh, and knows a ton about football. Uh, many of you have seen him on television, either on the football field or in the broadcast booth, and now he's made it to Chiefs Chat. So you, you can't get too, too much higher than that. You, you, you're climbing that scale. So. <laughs> so, so without further ado, Julie, please introduce today's guest. Chief, we are thrilled to welcome an NFL legend today. We are so honored he made time to be here with us to boost morale for our military community. He played 12 seasons with Washington and was the cornerstone of the team's Super Bowl victory in 1982. He is an MVP, an NFL MVP, a two-time pro bowler, and one of the best quarterbacks to ever grace the field. He has a new book. It's called How to Be a Champion Every Day, Six Timeless keys to success please help us give a warm chief chat welcome to the one and only joe theisman hey. Oh, hey thank you thanks so much for having me everybody it's um it's an honor and a thrill for me to be on chief chat with y'all today i mean uh i have such great admiration for the men and women in our military and they are the true heroes in this world you know, just want to, well, one quick story before you get started. I guess people have said, I've never been a microphone I didn't like, so I may as well start right now. <laughs> um, I, you know, as, as athletes, people come up to you and say, You're, you know, you were my hero growing up and all that stuff. And it's appreciated very much. Uh, but truthfully, I believe the men and women that put on the uniform and defend our freedoms are the real heroes in this world. And I, I tell everybody when I get a chance to do my speeches and talk to different individuals is when you see someone in uniform, if you're traveling through an airport or someplace, just take a second to say thank you. I don't think we thank our military men and women enough. Just a simple thank you. And, and it's amazing. I've had people come up and say, no one's ever said that to me. And I just, I don't understand it. Um, because to me, they are the true heroes of, of what this world's all about today. And I just consider myself very lucky, like I said, to be able to share some stories and some conversation with you today. Excellent, Joe. You're, you're absolutely right. Fully, fully agree with your sentiment. For all of those who are just joining us or just watching, you can leave a comment or a note below in the comment section for Joe, and you can share some love with him and your questions. You can also start a watch party right now and enjoy this live interview with your friends. And if you're not following Chief Chat, now is a good time to start because we have these chats every Tuesday and Thursday, and we have incredible guests lined up through the fall. Awesome, awesome. So uh, Joe, man, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we, we are truly, truly honored to have you with us. Um, before we get started, can you let the audience know uh, where you call us today? And I know we talked a little bit about your, your Zoom coming up missing on your yeah. computer and we blamed it on COVID. So uh, we just want to know uh, where you call us from and how, how you've been spending your time uh, during the pandemic. Well, Master Sergeant, I was basically going to do this on my computer. And then when I logged into my computer this morning, somebody stole my Zoom. <laughs> um, so I've been I've been literally literally scrambling for the last 15 minutes trying to figure out how to get it so I figured you know what I can just do this over the phone it's real simple and so uh you know now I'm, I'm at my home in Memphis Tennessee and uh I'm just able to to sit here and and uh spend some time with you all and like every like everybody else um this is such a challenging time for all of us uh the routines that we knew the things that we got accustomed to all, all of a sudden disappeared in an instant. I mean, I tell people all the time, snap your fingers. That's how quickly life changes. 
And uh, I, instead of using the word change in this pandemic we're in, I, I look at this as an opportunity. Uh, I think that we have a chance to look at ourselves. We have a chance to look at our lives, our businesses, our relationships, and really do a deep dive on who we are, the things that are important in our lives. Uh, in football, basically, uh, each year there's a bye week. And during that bye week, the teams don't examine other op their opponents. They examine themselves. So we've had like this six month bye week in our life where we have a chance now to take a look at who we are, like I say, the things we want to do going forward in our life. And so to me, I've tried to analyze my relationships and my family, the work relationships I have. Um, I wanted to work on my golf game, but I hurt my shoulder five months ago. So I'm just now getting back into it. And, and so to me, it's a great opportunity to be able to look at what life is all about for you going forward. Take the foundations that we've built and open your eyes and your mind to the opportunities going forward. And that's really what I've tried to do. Awesome. Well stated, Joe. Thank you for sharing that. All right, let's get things kick off, uh, so to speak, and talk a little bit about football. Let's take it back to 1982 when you had the pleasure of beating the Miami Dolphins uh, in the Super Bowl. I remember it. Julie thought I was five years old, but I had a reminder I was 12. <laughs> but, um, but what do you remember from that game? What do you take away from that game? And how do you practice that in your life now? You know, it's really funny, um, Sean. I, I just, I think about that football game and the experience that we went through. None of us had ever gone through it before. It's like the first time you're experiencing the Super Bowl festivities. And they're so much bigger today than they were back then. Right. I mean, you didn't you didn't have the fanfare like you have today. It was an international event, but not like, again, it is today. Um, and I remember I remember running out on the football field. The offense was introduced. And um, I actually when I got to the stadium, I walked all the way around the place. I wanted to see it all. I wanted to take in that moment. And then when we were introduced, I sort of hopped over the goal line because I didn't want to trip. I don't really raise my feet real high when I run. I'm sort of a shuffle runner. And I didn't want to trip over the goal line during introductions. So that's, that's, that's one of the things I remember in that particular game. The other was the opportunity I had to knock the ball away from Kim Bo Camper. And to all of you that might be Miami Dolphin fans that are watching out there, I'm not going to apologize to you, okay? I just want you to know that. This isn't an I'm sorry we beat you kind of thing. It was incredible. But uh, when I had an opportunity to knock the ball away from Kim uh, in the end zone, that moment just stays in my life because, I, oddly enough, I played the position of quarterback all my life, 12 years professionally, three or four years in college, and since I was 12 years old. And the one play I think that stands out in my mind more than anything was a defensive play. And, of yeah. course, taking the last snap when we're going to be the world champions. So I stepped in the huddle. I looked around at the 10 guys, and I started to get emotional. And I looked, and I said, winning Super Bowl formation on two. I took the snap, knelt down, and it was like, wow, we did it. I mean, it, it's a dream come true. Right. It was absolutely a dream come true. I, ever since I was a little boy, um, that's the position I wanted to be. Awesome. Yeah, no, that was, that was an excellent, great story. Um, man, win, winning Super Bowl formation on two. Man. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Great call. And it's a great, that, that, was, that, was a great, that was definitely a winning call. Uh, so you played under the legendary coach, uh, Joe Gibbs. Yeah. And so um, can you tell us what he brought to the team and uh, what enduring lessons that you learned from him? You know, the thing about Coach Gibbs, um, when he first, we were, it was his first head coaching job. So I was his first quarterback as a head coach. And um, we're different personalities. We're strong-minded personalities. I mean, he had, he had a way that he wanted to do it, and I had a way that I had done it before. And uh, to be honest with you, I had to learn Joe's way. Uh, he learned about me, but uh, he did things a certain way. He was a very detailed individual. This is the one thing I knew about Joe, is he left no stone unturned. We used to sit in meetings. They would spend hours. The coaches would meet till 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. And during that time, they would discuss maybe one or two plays. They'd spend an hour on a play just to make sure we got it right. And when wow. we stepped on a football field, I guarantee you, we were the most prepared football team in the National Football League. I have tremendous respect for a lot of coaches, lots of them in the Hall of Fame. But when it came to Joe's preparation, he was absolutely incredible. And he really taught me all about the little things. The li you take care of the little things, the big things will take care of themselves. 
And uh, that's the way we approached it. And he also, the other thing he did too, is he surrounded himself with great people. I think one of the most important aspects of leadership is who you choose to be on your team, whether it's a player or whether it's a coach. Uh, for example, Joe was an offensive mind. And so defense wasn't, wasn't his strength. So he hired a gentleman by the name of Richie Pettibone. Yeah. Richie was a heck of a defensive coordinator. All these stories are in the book, by the way. Uh, but Richie was an uh, absolutely incredible defensive coordinator. And Joe turned it over to Richie to run. Then we had another guy by the name of Wayne Severe who ran our special teams, the three units that are a part of a football team. And Joe allowed Wayne to do his job. And, you know, Joe was our head coach. No question about it. He was the authority. But yet he delegated that authority to others when it came to the specifics of the positions that were played. And I, I think that's very important. And that was another lesson I learned from him. I mean, it's great. There's, there's so many parallels to, to what you just said to what the military and how we lead our teams as well. So. Yes. Thank, thank yeah, I, I just that's why that's that's another. You know, the, I wrote the book on the premise of the world of sports, the world of business and our own lives all parallel one another. And I have quite a few references of the military in the book. I mean, the book's dedicated to the men and women of our service. I mean, I, that's just how strongly I felt about it. This was a labor of love for five years. But uh, I, I just I think of the way a unit is put together and the conversations that I've had with people about it. And uh, all those, those three areas really all parallel one another. Yeah. That's spot on. Really good. And I had the pleasure. It's nice to hear that about Coach Gibbs. I had the pleasure of meeting him in uh, Delaware in 2013. Uh, I think it was at a prayer breakfast and then uh, got to talk to him for a few minutes. And just what a splendid guy, you know, the humility of what he shows. Just it's amazing. And look what, and look what he's done in the world of racing. Right. I mean, he, he's, he's now in the, in the um, race car or NASCAR Hall of Fame. Uh, he's in the Football Hall of Fame. I mean, how many people can transition from one element of life, not just sports, but one one job to another and do it with such tremendous, as you say, humility and efficiency? And, and yep. I, I think about racing, you know, in football, you can basically game plan and, and have and choose the right athletes in, in racing. All you have is a car. And if the, <laughs> if, the, if, the, if, the, if the car breaks down, you don't win anything. I mean, that, that always amazes me that everything relies on that automobile being able to run the way it's supposed to run. 100%. All right. So you were part of a great team in the 80s back when the, you know, the Washington football team were, were taking it to the NFC East and everybody else, smash mouth football was at its best. So how was it turning around and hand that ball off to number 44, John Riggins? I'm telling you something, having John in the backfield was an absolute blessing for me. I mean, he's in the Hall of Fame. He was a Super Bowl MVP. Every one of those things well-deserved, great honors. And he, he was phenomenal. I mean, he was about six foot two, 230 pounds. He was a uh, hurdles. I think he ran track at Kansas. Um, he was unbelievable when it came to his physical skills. People underestimated his speed. You knew his right. power, you knew his size, but he under, they underestimated his speed and his ability to be able to run away from people. Uh, Michael Downs was a safety with the Dallas Cowboys. We were playing them, uh, I guess, in 82 or 83. And I remember turning around, handing the ball to John up the middle. As he started up the middle, he veered to the right. Michael took a bad angle. John went 60 yards and Michael couldn't catch him. <laughs> and it was just knowing he was back there, you knew that he was going to get at least two or three yards. I mean, I'd call plays and, and I would go the wrong way and it wouldn't even be blocked and John get a four yard game. We, I can tell you one quick story. So we're playing the Detroit Lions in Detroit Silver Dome, loud as can be. I turned around, handed the ball to John on the goal line. He hit Luther Bradley, who was a defensive back right in the chest with his helmet. And there, were, there was a pile of people there. And all I saw was Luther's helmet pop up in the air and start to roll through the end zone. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, he's killed him. He knocked the guy's <laughs> head off. I couldn't believe this. But uh, yeah, it was just, a, it was a thrill to play with him. I mean, I, I, defined, I defined our football team this way. We were a group of characters with character. Hmm. Very nice. I like that. That's all any of us can hope to work with, right? Characters right. with character. So <laughs> wanted to pause for just a moment, Joe, to share some of the comments we're receiving um, on our live feed. We do have viewers watching from all over the world. 
I just saw a couple comments and now they have flashed off my screen. This is what happens when we're when we're See? live. Um, See, this is what I was talking not... about, Julie, technology. I know, right? Um, but I do I do want to give a throw a shout out. Uh, somebody somebody hit me up yesterday. They they saw the promo and they were uh, it was uh, Edwin Blakes. He he's one of my uh, uh, retired Air Force uh, co-workers. He is a huge, huge, huge Washington fan. And he was like, uh, he's like, Chief, I want to cancel my meeting so I can watch your Chief set. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, big, sh big shout out to Edwin Blakes out there. Thank hey, you. That's, that's how you know you've hit it big, right? When people are canceling meetings to watch your show. Good job. Yes, thank you. Uh, really, really a great job. Well, we have Brian watching from Kansas. Uh, Jen says hello from NASJRB Fort Worth. And then we had a question about what you thought the uh, the conference was going to look like um, this year. The well, East, yeah, what it was going to look like. The NFC East is interesting because you've got a new coach in Dallas. You've got a new coast coach in Washington. Mm -hmm. You have a new coach in New York, and you have the same coach in Philadelphia. Uh, and and I think because there hasn't been. I believe sufficient time to be able to really get your teams ready. There were no what's called OTAs, off-season training. There were no mini camps. There were no preseason games. As a matter of fact, I think the first two or three regular season games are going to look a lot like preseason games. You're going to yeah. see guys with pulled hamstrings. You're going to see guys that are going to be huffing and puffing, trying to get their breath. Dallas is a very stacked football team. And um, uh, Dak has become a heck of a football player. And Zeke is, as we know, a heck of a running back. They're loaded down there. They had a great draft. Um, Washington, it defensively, I think will be a little bit like San Francisco was a year ago, led by their defense. Their offense is very young. Philadelphia is a team that you should expect a fair amount from because they've been in the same system. So the requirements of getting a new system installed aren't as, aren't as difficult. And the Giants, again, going through a transition, although Saquon Barkley, to me, is one of the top three running backs uh, in the National Football League and pretty mm -hmm. darn close to one of the best, uh, which would put him in the top three. Um, I think I don't want to say the Dallas Cowboys are the best in the division. because You should, absolutely, just, you should absolutely say that. It just Please doesn't don't. come out of my mouth very smoothly. <laughs> That's the idea. You know, it's like... But they're they're loaded, I think. I think Philadelphia, I'd probably have to go Dallas, Philadelphia, Washington, and New York. Mm -hmm. That would be the order I would look at it. And again, what do you base it off of? I mean, you all you can do is base it off of what perceives to be talent. I would not underestimate the Washington football team, though. They have five former or current number one picks, first round picks in their defensive line. Uh, they're young at the quarterback position. They're young at the running back position. They're young at the wide receiver position. The offensive line is, has been one in flux. Over the last three years, the Washington football team has had more guys on injured reserve than anybody in football. And as you know, you just can't play with a lack of continuity. Matter of fact, a, a little statistic. I believe since I got hurt in 1985, there have been 37 different starting quarterbacks in the National Football League. 37 of them. And, and you just, you have to have somebody behind that position. Then you think of, of teams like the Green Bay Packers that have had two in the last 20 or the 49ers that had two with, over a 20 year period. So yeah. I, I think it's going to be essential that, is, that you establish some type of continuity. Well, y'all heard it here first. Dallas Cowboys, number one in the, in the division. Well, that's, you know, begrudgingly, <laughs> okay? Let's qualify that, begrudgingly. That's awesome, awesome, awesome. We, we're also going to change our name to America's football team. So, uh, so oh, we come on. <laughs> oh, come. Didn't you do that already? <laughs> yeah, somebody did. Yeah. Somebody did. <laughs> so, so Joe, like, like we talked about, and I'm glad we, we're talking football, um, but, you know, it's been, it's been a rough year, and Americans want to get to some type of normalcy. And uh, football is definitely going to play a big role. Uh, how do you think the game will look this year without having fans in, uh, in the stands? Well, you know, it, it's interesting because college football has started already, which is great. And I feel bad for the, for the kids that weren't able to play uh, and have a chance in their senior year to be able to go out and enjoy it. I mean, you, you don't get another opportunity uh, to have a senior year in college. I mean, it's over, it's over, it's done, you move on. I had an opportunity – in uh, 1974, during a strike year, when I was the, when I was a rookie with the Washington football team, uh, I played in an empty stadium. 
the vets were on strike. And so mm-hmm. all of us were rookies and free agents at RFK Stadium. The stadium seats seated 55,000. There were 3,000 people in the stands. So I know what it's like to play in an empty stadium. And uh, it's, it's eerie because everything you say echoes. Um, the, the, you, and now they say they're going to pump in crowd noise. It's different listening to people as opposed to seeing their faces. Right. Uh, the, seeing the physical bodies. I, I think it's going to be different. But look at what baseball has done. Look at how they've adapted. Hockey, basketball. The good thing for the football, National Football League, is they're the last of those four sports to really get started. So you have had a chance to learn the protocol of the other teams and the other uh, leagues to be able to figure out exactly how you might be able to get a full season in. And, and I believe we will. Uh, the players are very responsive. And you have to give the NBA guys a ton of credit to be stuck in a bubble for as long as they've been there in just a few instances where people have, you know, tried to sort of circumvent the system. um, For the most part, they've done a terrific job. And that's, that's a great credit to all the guys. Yeah, that's great. It'll be interesting for sure. But uh, but you know, but they'll get used to it this week. That's the thing. They'll get used to it. The the first couple, two, three games, maybe it's going to be a little different. And then eventually they may be letting more and more fans. And I know in Kansas city where, one of the one of the guys was, um, you know, they're talking about 16, 17,000 in, in, a, in a stadium and spreading right. them out. So and they've seen it. We saw it at some college stadiums, too. So we're, we're getting back. There'll never be normal like we knew it, but we're getting back to what would be a new normal. Right. Well, I think Julie took a question that I had for you off the uh, Facebook Live channel, but so I'm just going to switch it up a little bit here. And just uh, since I know that you're with the, uh, you know, the Washington football team, you get to watch them over training camp uh who who stands out to you the most right now that's that's you know chase young is as advertised the number one pick that we had the kid out of ohio state he's quick he's big yep. he's fast he's strong um he's going to be exciting to watch i think Dwayne haskins has looked very good Dwayne, our young quarterback dropped 20 pounds moving around really well again a new system to learn uh this will be his third at, since he left college um he looks good Uh, Terry McLaurin, the young wide receiver, continues to get better and better. And and those are the ones that have jumped out to me as far as uh, what I managed to watch in a very limited amount of practice. Great. Awesome. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you mentioned uh, Dwayne Haskins. Do you think there's a ceiling for him or or what do you? I like what I, you know, I like a lot about Dwayne. What I really liked last year in the seven games that he played, the first couple of games, they You know, he was thrown into the lurch. He had no idea. Just like any rookie, you you don't know what you're looking at. He's trying to comprehend the system. He's trying to get the plays out of his mouth and all that. Every rookie goes through that. Every person that goes through sometimes when you change organizations. But he got better and better each week. And that's what you always look for, is you look for progress from a young player. Uh, Is he making the same mistakes that he made before? Or has he eliminated those and continue to grow and get better? And that's what Dwayne did last year. He dedicated himself completely this year uh, to being a little bit lighter, being able to move a little bit more. You're not going to confuse Dwayne with Lamar Jackson, okay, it, it, with the Ravens. They're, he's not that kind of a quarterback, but he throws the ball out of the pocket very well. And I believe that's the number one prerequisite in football, to be able to throw the ball out of the pocket and allow other people to do their job. See, we're facilitators. We take the ball and we give it to somebody else and we facilitate their ability to be able to go do what they're going to do. And, and that's the thing you have to understand. When you try and do too much, like in anything, uh, things don't go very well. But, right. And Dwayne's, Dwayne's done a wonderful job transitioning in. I'm excited for him going forward. So switching gears just a little bit, Joe, you are known for being so resilient in the face of adversity. What advice do you have for people who might be struggling right now because of the pandemic? I think one of the most important things is you can't ever let somebody tell you you can't do something. That's first of all. I came out of high school. I was five feet, 10, 152 pounds. And there was an article uh, in a Newark, New Jersey newspaper, I believe. It it said, Theismann will get killed at Notre Dame, (laughs) Um, which at 152 pounds, they probably had good reason to say what they said. But uh, and, and and then I went there. I was one of 13 quarterbacks when I entered the university. And, and you just have, you have to figure out a way to make the environment that you're in work for you. How do you make it work for you? Don't, you know, you, you take it, you seek advice. 
there's a little saying that I absolutely love. The day you stop learning is the day you stop living. Mm. Like we need to know more today than we knew yesterday. We need to know more tomorrow than we knew today. So you constantly are, are seeking information and that allows you to grow, grows mentally. You grow, you can grow physically from a, a conditioning standpoint. What are the exercises that I can do? I'll be, I'll be 71 tomorrow. Um, I'm Happy celebrating birthday. a I am. I'm celebrating a birthday. I don't do the same stuff I did before uh, from a, in a weight room. I don't have the same routine, but yet I try to modify it so that I can get the most out of what I can to stay in shape, to be able to get up and feel good. And mentally feeling good is just as important as physically feeling good. I guarantee you, everybody out there watching, if you're having sort of a downer day or things are humdrum, what you'll do, you start working out and all of a sudden the day changes. Your mind gets more alert, your body feels good. And all of a sudden you can attack the day in a much more, a much better way. And uh, so for me, uh, I just think that we have to find ways to occupy our mind, stay disciplined to different things, uh, get out of bed. I don't have to tell the military this, get out of bed early. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think that you can check that box pretty much. Pretty oh, easy. Yeah, definitely. But, uh, but just, just to, and, and don't be afraid to grow. Don't get stuck in that silo that you just left. Grow in so many different ways. Grow musically, grow artistically, grow as a person, grow in relationships. I, I think what we're seeing in society today, it's an opportunity for us to observe, to grow, to listen, to learn, and then to take action to be a better people at everything that we do. Mm. So these, and these are some great leadership lessons. And I know you have your new book, How to Be a Champion Every Day, Six Timeless Keys to Success. That was just released. And for people who are watching, you should be able to find a copy of that at your exchange soon. So Joe, what is the biggest lesson that you are hoping readers take away from that new book? I think that what I want them to take away is the examples that are in there, Julie, is I'm no different than anybody else. I go through the trials and tribulations just like you do. I've gone through hurdles. Some of the things I want people to read in there, maybe I can save them from a pitfall somewhere. Maybe they're, they're dealing with something and it might shed a little light to give them an opportunity to look at it a little bit different. Um, the book, like I say, it, it's, I've been giving speeches for 40 years and I talk about goals and attitudes and, and people, people, relationships and teamwork and motivation. They're all a part of our lives. And there are stories in there that I hope that resonate with people from, from 10 years old to 90 years old, um, men and women, both. And everybody out there that's, you know, if you, if, if you're, you're married and you're, you, your partner or your husband or your wife, you can look at this and say, I can, I can be a better person. I can do this. Um, it's not a how to book. It's a book of examples where you take what you think maybe applies to you. And if it works great, if it doesn't, it's something you've tried, but um, there are lessons that I've learned in my life from, from great people, uh, General Powell, for example, is one that's in the book. Young man by the name of Joey Bozick. Joey's a triple amputee. Uh, incredible guy. Uh, I, I met him, at, I met him at, at Camp Lejeune playing in a golf tournament. Um, lost his limbs uh, um, when he was deployed. Mm -hmm. And he just, it, but, he, but he never stopped. He never quit. I mean, I think he does some type of jujitsu now. I, I mean, and, and it just, I think of people like Joey and, and, uh, and General Powell, and I, I think just how lucky I was to be able to meet these type of people. And, and that's another thing, too. I think everybody take something from the people that you've met. Take some of the lessons that they have. Listen to them. Listen to their life. You find out that our lives are all quite similar, just dealt with in a different way. And different circumstances are presented in a different way. But in all, we're really all the same people. Yes, sir. So you, we, we had a conversation about um, you, you going to different bases and, and, um, and, and they let you fly a C-130 from <laughs> in a simulator at yeah. night to Albuquerque. Into Albuquerque. Yeah, way to go. I've, I've, been out on, I've been out on the USS Wyoming, our, one of our nuclear subs. I was out there fascinated by that. And then uh, at Holbert Air Force Base outside of, uh, outside of Destin, Florida, which I have a home, um, they, I went over and visited the airmen and had a chance to talk to them. And then they took me out and allowed me to fly a simulation 
Uh, so we took off and they said, we're going to Albuquerque. I said, great. And then I got, you know, I'm flying along and like, I'm, it's daylight. I'm, you know, you're flying between mountains and the simulator and everything. All of a sudden they say, now let's see how you do at night. I said, what do you mean at night? So they, they take all the darkness. They, they bring a sheet, uh, shield down. And now you're going to fly by instruments. So now I'm flying by instruments and you can, you can see the, the topography and the mountains and everything. And so I just want you to know, I did manage to land in Albuquerque and I did not ruin a plane. So I'm very <laughs> proud of the fact that I managed to get from, from uh, Holbert Air Force Base to Albuquerque, New Mexico in a simulator and managed to land the plane. And you know, this was amazing. Everybody, you, you see the jets, the, the 35s and, and all the different types of jets that fly around. And then you get in a C-130 and it's like the tortoise and the hare. I mean, you are just, you're, like, <laughs> you're, you're chugging. And when you turn that thing, holy mackerel, it, it doesn't turn on a dime. It turns on a, a stack of $50 bills. I mean, yeah, it, yeah. it takes forever to get, but I just, I love the experience. I love the military. I love everyone that's involved in it. I respect everyone so much. I, I, there aren't words that I, that I can use that express my gratitude enough for everything that the men and women do for this country and for the freedom that they allow and give us and protect us. I just, I'm so appreciative. Yeah, we, we are re definitely appreciate your words of encouragement. Um, and uh, you, uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, you, you're in the gym, but you don't do what you used to do, uh, you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Can you tell us what, what, what kind of, what your fitness routine looks like or any, uh, any tips to stay in shape? Yeah, basically I, I, the thing that I didn't do earlier that I do now, so I try and stretch a lot more. I think stretching is, is a key to everything. Flexibility is so important. I'm not a flexible person, but I try as much as I can. Um, Are you doing I yoga? Do, uh, no, I don't do yoga. I don't do hot yoga or cold yoga <laughs> because I've got too many parts of my body that are put together that don't stretch in the way they should. Yeah. You know, staples <laughs> in my shoulders, broken legs, backs, everything else. Um, but I, I did a show by, uh, with uh, called Bodies in Motion many, many years ago with a guy by the name of Gilad. Um, and he was a, um, he was an Israeli Olympian who tore his Achilles and then dedicated himself to bodybuilding. And he said, look, if you're going to be on camera, what you do is you concentrate on your biceps, your calves and your abs. So, uh, <laughs> what I'm <laughs> taking that advice and, uh, I try and do, I either do a bike, my wife and I will walk when, when we're together so much, uh, now, especially Robbie loves to walk. She'll walk six miles. So I try and walk as much as I can with her. I get on a bike and ride a bike. Uh, from a cardiovascular standpoint, I do, um, I do upper body and lower body. I do leg extensions. I do squats. I do uh, push-ups. Being that I hurt my shoulder, uh, the doctor advised me not to do anything above the shoulder so everything is out to the side or down. I'll do curls. And I spend about an hour in the gym every three days. I used to go five. And that's the biggest change as I've gotten a little bit older. Um, I, you have to give the body a chance to recuperate. I mean, you just, you just can't keep wearing down muscles and expect them to respond for you. So you have to give them a chance to rest. So some days I'll go two days a week. Some days I'll go three, but, uh, I just don't want to do anything to hurt my golf swing. I mean, that's the most important <laughs> thing right now. <laughs> priorities. You got to have priorities. And, uh, and I don't want I don't want to pull a muscle or hurt myself. I went through with my shoulder and I just, I don't feel like I want to do that any again. Uh, getting when you're older getting rehabilitated takes a long time and so uh i just try and do everything i can to protect my back and be able to protect my golf swing it's awesome well you look great for someone's gonna be 71 tomorrow so whatever you're doing is working thank you thank you yeah, that's awesome so as we know fitness is important so what about nutrition is there like uh what's your approach and is there a go-to meal or a snack that you go to that you know helps you out well, i i um I'm a sucker for Oreo cookies. Okay. So that's, <laughs> that's perfect. You know, I guess oh, that man, fits I love, right I in, love it. but I, you know, there's two, there's two, I, I, I gave up red meat about 30 years ago. It just didn't process through my body. And I sort of felt sluggish. And I say this to anybody, take the time, try and take it out of your, out of your menu and your meals for maybe two weeks. See how you feel. If you feel better then you do it on a limited basis. My wife loves a good steak. Um, I prefer chicken and salmon. My wife made a, a salmon dish the other night. It was just absolutely fantastic. Then that's one thing about, 
uh, the pandemic, it's given, I think, a lot of us a chance to get into the kitchen. Not me, but uh, <laughs> my wife. But uh, I get to be the benefactor of it. Uh, but salmon, I think, is a great meal. Salmon, rice, vegetables, uh, you know, fruit. Uh, like I said, my two weaknesses are ice cream and cookies. I'll, have, I'll limit myself to two Oreo cookies every other day. And I will definitely limit myself to three scoops <laughs> of, of ice cream about uh, three times a week. But I just, there's certain things you can't, you can't give up everything. Right. But um, I really, I try, I try and eat healthy. I try and uh, keep an eye on my diet. And, and the big thing about weight is I run, I, I played at a hundred. I never played heavier. 15 years of professional football. 12 in the NFL, three in the CFL. I never played heavier than 185 pounds. Today, I run between 215 and 220. Um, if I get any lower than that, I get cold. I, I feel skinny at 210. So um, I, I usually hang between 215 and 220. And uh, it depends on what you eat, how much you eat. I've talked to a lot of people about dieting. And I think there are lots of diets out there. But the time of day you eat, and the amount that you consume are so critical. You, if you're a little, if you feel like you're a little bit heavy, you want to get your stomach a chance to shrink a little bit, so that you and, and eat eat until it's comfortable, not until you're bursting. Right. And, and that's that's what I really try and do. I mean, when I was a kid growing up, and I'm sure many people out there have heard this, my mom used to say, "Clean your plate. You're not leaving the table until you clean your plate." <laughs> And uh, it's like being in the restaurant business for 40 plus years as well. Uh, I've, I've used to argue with my partners all the time and my chef and my managers, you know, let's cut the portions back. And they say, Joe, look, they can always take them home for leftovers. And uh, so that's sort of the way I do it. But I, I try and watch what I eat. I try to watch the time of day and I watch the amount that I eat. And, and I'm a chicken and fish guy. Great. And Oreos. <laughs> and, oh well and oreos and ice cream and sometimes i'll have them sometimes i'll have them together so oh, I mean, that's, you know, I a mean, beautiful combination that is and that's what i took away from this discussion is joe says i can eat ice cream and oreos that's right. so. why not <laughs> it has been so it's been an absolute pleasure to have you with us today and before we wrap up can you please remind us all where we can get a copy of how to be a champion every day and I where can viewers go to find you online? Because I've seen you on Twitter, so I know you're out there. Right. My Twitter handle is at Theisman7. Uh, that's me. And um, the book um, hopefully will be available in the exchanges uh, everywhere. And you can also order it on Amazon and at your local bookstores as well. But um, I'm looking forward to hopefully getting it into the exchanges. Like I said, uh, to me, um, there's nothing better than the men and women that put that uniform on to give us a chance to be able to live our lives and do the things we do. And I'm most appreciative of it. Uh, but, uh, and, and you can have as much ice cream as you want, Julie. Yes. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Go for it, girl. Go for it. Yes. <laughs> so, so man, this has been an awesome interview and we really, really appreciate you spending some time with us today. Uh, just know this means so much to the military community. Uh, we appreciate what you do. And so uh, we appreciate what you do and our airmen, soldiers, Marines, sailors, and Coast Guard members out there appreciate what you do as well. Uh, we thank you for your support uh, of the military and you getting out there and meeting people and flying to Albuquerque and doing all <laughs> things you do to, 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 to show support uh, for what we do. So we definitely appreciate you uh, and thank you. And uh, if you don't mind hanging back after the interview is over with, uh, I got to get some information from you. But, you, but you got it. Thank you so much for having me and, and God bless everybody and stay safe. Thank you. Dude, cheek right. chat out.